Okay. Um, hi, hello everyone. Uh, I realized right after introducing myself, I could have said first time boom mic wearer. Um, no laughs. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're here from CUB, that's the Citizens Utility Board. Uh, we're a nonprofit uh, utility customer advocate for Illinois. Um, so that covers uh, all the regulated utilities, primarily that means electricity, gas, uh, and phones. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the data science research that we've been doing lately. Um, up, until, up until about four years ago, almost everyone uh, in Illinois uh, had their electricity measured once a month um, on a physical meter that uh, someone had to go out and check every month. Uh, so that means, per customer, 12 annual data points. Um, now, with almost, uh, in, in ComEd territory, we have almost total uh, installation of smart meters. Um, those readings are coming in every five minutes. Um, and massively more data points than before. Um, starting in 2017, uh, a decision at the Illinois Commerce Commission uh, allowed the electri electric utilities to make that data uh, public, um, make that data available to third parties um, in, in an uh, anonymized format. Um, what that means for us uh, at CUB is we can pay ComEd for data sets for almost all of their smart meter customers, um, and we get half hourly uh, observations for a whole year. Uh, we can actually get three years at a time. Um, so, top of my head, what, 87, 60 hours in a year times two times, right now, a million and a half customers. Um, so, when you're only getting a half hourly picture uh, of usage, um, Sorry, when you're only getting a half hourly picture of usage, you don't get to see the daily load shape of a customer. Um, and that, you're really losing a lot of information. Um, as a third party, you can take what the utility says their overall lo load shape looks like, but there's really fine gradations uh, in the actual usage patterns that people are using. Um, a little more about the data. So. Uh, the main data set that we're using, customers are anonymous, but they are identified by their location. Uh, we've been doing most of our work with a data set that identifies them at the nine digit zip code. So in a lot of cases, you're talking about a single block or, 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 or multiple city blocks. Uh, in some cases downtown, that's one single building. Um, so you're able to get really local. Uh, about where these people are. Um, that allows us to tie it into census data uh, and we can start looking at uh, demographic uh, indicators about who is using their energy uh, in what way. Um, another batch of data that we spent a lot, that we've more recently been spending time looking at is local weather data. Um, this, this is a, a map of the Meso West uh, data uh, weather stations that we've uh, been pulling data from in, in our recent analysis. Um, so I'll talk about our most, our most recent paper. Um, we did a cluster analysis of, uh, of all the, actually, not just ComEd, but also Ameren territory, which is all of downstate Illinois, um, and used K-means clustering to uh, separate ev all of those customers into six different groups based on their average uh, summer weekday. Um, and you can see th this top, those are presented in percentage of maximum load, um, so they're, they're normalized for volume. But when then down here, you're looking at those clusters by actual volume, uh, and you can see there's some pretty big differences. You have a lot of people using 
very little. Um, you have some very flat load shapes. Uh, and then you have some, some very peaky load shapes that are using significantly more volume and match the, the ComEd load shape uh, as a whole uh, much more closely. Now, what this means for consumers uh, is right now, probably the majority of, of, of customers are on a flat rate, uh, rate design, uh, meaning that every kilowatt hour that you use, you're paying the same amount. But there's a really big difference uh, in the actual cost causation of kilowatt hours uh, and, and the, the value of, of a kilowatt hour depending on the time of day. Uh, in the middle of the night, early morning, uh, that's putting very little stress on the grid. Uh, but in these peak times of day, that's when you're really seeing the cost drivers uh, of the grid. Uh, electricity is a really complex commodity. There's like five different things that you're paying for on your bill. Um, the transmission that to take everything from the generators, um, the marginal generation unit, um, there's forward capacity obligations, uh, meaning uh, regional grid planners have to plan for, okay, here's how much we know we're going to need to have for an emergency, so um, there's forward payments that, that we make um, to, to, to cover that. Uh, and then there's the actual delivery grid itself, um, particularly, so the only one of those uh, that, that it really makes sense to charge on a marginal basis is, is the generation, because you're paying for fuel or, or uh, well, mostly fuel. Um, but the other ones are, are mostly driven by the size of the peak, because you have to build a big enough tube for it to all go through. Um, so. These guys, if you're being charged the same for every kilowatt hour, these flatter designs, uh, flatter clusters, uh, are arguably paying more than they should. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. These are all uh, residential uh, or or some very small commercial. Um, like, um, there's very few people who are still on that small residential rate design, or small commercial, I mean. Oh, we, we did filter yeah, those out. Yeah, these are all residential. Um, so, well here, I'll go back to here. These are individual nine-digit zip codes um, that are coded by uh, the, the most likely customers um, to the, the, the most, uh, most frequent customers in each, each location. Um, these clusters uh, one, three, and five, the blue, green, and yellow, we see lots of blue and green uh, in the, sort of the farther suburbs of the city, um, a, another concentration in close. Uh, and when you look, uh, and almost everyone, uh, most clusters really outside of the metro area, you, we see these blues, yellows, and greens. Um, and then you look at, at the zoom into the city, we see big concentrations of cluster two uh, on the west side and the south side. Um, and very, very few blue, greens. There's some yellow up here on the north, on the near north side mixed in. And we look at what those customers are, what those usage patterns, and th that, that's the flattest uh, usage pattern of them all. Um, so what that means is, or what that strongly suggests is that uh, the current rate design, the flat rate design, uh, is probably significantly overcharging low-income communities. Um, so that was one of the main conclusions we pulled out of this. Um, we were seeing much peakier summer usage uh, in, in suburbs uh, and higher income areas. There was a strong correlation um, 
for income um, to be in one of those peakier clusters. Um, which, uh, so the flip side of that cross subsidization is uh, there's really high grid savings potential for energy efficiency programs that are targeted at those areas. A lot of times we think of energy efficiency programs as good for helping low income people lower their bills. Um, but there's a lot like lowering grid costs, lowering peak usage lowers the cost for everyone. So the conclusion that we drew out of this is that it's important to promote energy efficiency everywhere, not just in low income communities because keeping peak down saves everyone money. Uh, I'll go a little more quickly uh, through, <coughs> we have kind of a work in progress as we're looking at the consumer cost of climate change. Uh, we built a degree days uh, usage model uh, to associate local temperature and weather to predict electricity usage. Uh, I showed you the Meso West weather stations. Um, these collect temperature, humidity, wind speed, a lot of other things that I don't know what they really mean. Um, uh, and we downloaded that data going back uh, all as far back as we had our electricity data um, and uh, correlated local usage hour by hour uh, with local weather patterns. Um, and then using uh, the sort of the worst case climate scenario out there is the um, RCP 8.5 uh, uh, emissions pathway. Uh, using local temperature increases predicted under that, we uh, predicted hourly temperature out to 2050 and then used our model to predict the total increase in usage um, that would be caused by climate change. Uh, out through 2050 and the associated uh, billing increases that would go with that. Um, so that's, that's our plot of, of local temperature and average hourly usage. Not a, super surprising um, what we see in the higher temperatures. Um, so go through our next steps, what we're looking at right now. Um, our cluster research uh, we already published in the Electricity Journal, um, but I w was mentioning to, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. James? Yeah, no, Bruce. Bruce. I was mentioning to Bruce, um, because our, the data we used is so concentrated in the city, um, we know there's a lot of poor people in rural parts of the of the state too. Uh, and so figuring out a way to take that same research uh, farther out of the city um, to, to try and see if there's a difference, uh, if, that, if that income dis uh, difference uh, in usage persists in more rural areas uh, would be really interesting. Uh, and also try to get some numbers on what kind of cross subsidization we're seeing between those classes. Um, the cost of climate change uh, study, we're still sort of refining our, our estimation methods um, and the climate projections. Um, the, one of the things that I, just to give you guys an idea of, of what maybe ways you can help, uh, one of the things I'm trying to get a handle on is how to uh, interpolate increase in peak usage from increase in daily volume, because what we have right now is sort of day by day, um, not hour by hour because of, well, we tried an hour by hour regression model, but it's not really as reliable um, in the out years. Um, and then incorporating marginal GHG emissions uh, into what the, the impacts of that increase usage would be. Um, on the horizon, some other ideas that, that we're tossing around um, or other ways to look at this data, other ways to, to try and pull, pull numbers out of the, the, like ideas that people talk about. Um, now that we have 
actual hour by hour measurables. Um, uh, looking at what is the social equity of community uh, efficiency investments, um, like cooling islands, um, you know, how, how, much, uh, how much is that quantitatively helping um, uh, urban communities? Um, and what's the actual effect, uh, effectiveness of different types of energy efficiency programs on reducing peak demand um, is another thing we'd like to look at. Look at. Um, so, I put all this out there. Uh, we have a, a wealth of data. This Illinois is the first state in the country to make this type of data uh, available to third parties. Anyone can buy it. Um, I, Amarin, we didn't actually even pay for. Um, but uh, one thing I. One thing I'll, d I'll double back on, <coughs> on the data. The reason, the reason you don't, you have so much fewer dots in rural areas is because um, of that uh, uh, anonymity requirement for this data. In order to be included in the data set, you have to live in a dense enough area where there's 15 or more customers uh, or where no customer uses 15% or more of the load um, otherwise, you're, op you're, you're opening up those folks to, to data, to privacy um, invasions. Um, so when you get out of the dense area, you have way fewer locations clearing that uh, at the nine-digit zip code level. You can also get it at the five-digit zip code level. When we looked at Ameren, nowhere passes these bars there we had customers that could only be identified by by county uh, some by most by municipality um, there were some places where we could get five digit zip codes but nowhere um, could we get a nine digit zip code so that's why we, we just focused on northern Illinois for the demographic analysis anyway um, I forget why I had to double back on that. Uh, that's what we got. Um, the, for, for the ComEd data, um, if you're a nonprofit or, res or uh, educational school, educational school, um, it's 750 for three years. Uh, if you're not one of those, it's $1,500 for three years of data. Uh, but again, we have it already. Um, <laughs> so if you want to work with us, we're, we, we're happy to, to do, um, do some collaborating. Um, Dave, my boss, said we're even happy to, if you want to, if you want to just pick up some hours, we're happy to, to, to pay a little money. Um, uh, I have to talk to him about what that, what that actually means. Dave, Dave sometimes just kind of says things. And, um, so yeah, uh, areas to help would be uh, we, uh, if you're a GIS expert, you know we're able to do some of that. Um, Ramadeep's pretty good at it. Um, we uh, we're doing machine learning models. Um, if you have new ideas of what we can do of it, um, that's that's what we're what we'd love to collaborate on. A couple websites and a couple emails. Um, citizensutilityboard.org is our, our main site. We do a, a lot of, there's a lot of other things our organization does. Um, if you go to bigenergydata.info, that'll take you directly to the research section of our website. Um, and these are mine and Ramandeep's emails. So, <clears throat> you've already discovered some really interesting things about, about usage and, and what's, what's the legal or regulatory process for getting utilities to change rates based on, based on usage like that so that you know, when you're buying at peak times, you're paying more, basically? Sure. Are there policy yeah. recommendations that you want to see happen and how do you make that happen? Um, yeah. Uh, so, ComEd does offer uh, real-time pricing. Um, you can get, yeah, fully, you can sign up for real-time pricing. 
Um, they're working on a time of use rate price uh, pricing pilot, which um, I don't know how familiar uh, folks are uh, on rate design, but time of use, uh, you're looking at preset tiered prices for the day. You have, you have a set off-peak price, a set peak price, a set super peak price, um, and that's done ahead of time. So, so there's still some, uh, there's still some, uh, you know, variation depending on it, but it's still forward, forward procured. Um, uh, you can, you kind of think of flat rate pricing as an insurance policy. You're, you're paying a little more at some times so that you don't get overcharged at other times. When you do real-time pricing, you are opening yourself up to, to financial risk. Time of use, you still are, are shielded from, from a, a price spike, um, but you're not quite you know, reaping the full benefits if, if you're the type of user that, that would benefit from it. This is all opt-in, right? It is opt-in, um, right, right. Uh, you, can, you can currently opt-in for real-time pricing. You can opt-in to um, peak time rebates, which is a different uh, type of program uh, where if, if you sign up for this program, they'll send you a text, say, hey, we have a peak hour coming up. We'll give you a rebate for what you use less than your norm for that hour. Um, the time of use rate is still in a pilot phase. Um, uh, but right now, those are all just for the supply half of your bill. Um, there, there isn't anything right now that uh, includes the delivery portion of your bill, which for most people is about half of their bill. Um, you know, we'd like to see uh, a time of use rate that includes uh, delivery charges. Um, uh, consider, consider an opt-out time of use rate. Um, that, that's a little controversial uh, to, to get through. Um, because people, you know, people are scared of, of new things, but um, mostly helping to educate more people about, about what programs are out there. And that's actually what a, a large part of our staff does, is go out and uh, have public events and help people uh, figure out what, what programs are right for them. Hi, uh, I wonder if you had perhaps already connected with uh, in the Low Income Energy Issues Forum. They're based um, out here in Chicago. They, I've been to conferences where they talk about a lot of this. It just felt like a fit. Uh, I'll get your name from him afterwards. I, it doesn't ring a bell to me, but um, yeah, thanks. Next up. Um, I have a question about the cluster load rates. Um, yeah. there Normalize to peak usage, but cluster six in particular doesn't go like it has a peak that looks like 50. Like, what is that normalized to? It doesn't go all the way up. Sure. So each individual customer was normalized, and these are the cluster means of those normali normalizations. So if you looked at if you looked at an individual customer, they would all top out at one. This is the mean. So does that mean that those customers tend to, like what would cause them to spike to twice their average usage, not on a daily basis? Um, I'm trying to. So the. They're all, it, it, that's a good question. <laughs> One I probably could have answered better when we were still writing this paper. Um, I think that it's more about the timing, I think, uh, is maybe where the answer is. Um, no, that doesn't really make sense either. That's a good question. Do you know if there are any special rate arrangements for disabled people, their home lot, and therefore they use electricity in unique ways? Like, for example, they can't go out uh, for cooling. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen at home, and the AC is going to be running. Um, I'm not 
I, I'm sure there are. I'm not aware of what, what they are. Um, when one of those charts came up, you briefly mentioned some customers are getting overcharged. I was just trying to understand what that meant to be overcharged. Sure, sure. So um, relative to the cost they're placing on the grid. So this red line, um, if everyone's paying the same cents per kilowatt hour, red line is paying the same rate here that they're paying here. Like there's not a much difference in their usage throughout the day, but uh, there's some clusters which have uh, like the difference is about 80% and they are paying the same as the red ones. So the red ones are somewhat overcharged with the flat rate system right now. Because so the, the, the blue cluster is, is paying more because they're using more. Um, but the ratio of their high cost usage to their low cost usage is much different. Um, so they should, they're using much more high value kilowatt hours, but they're being charged for the same, uh, at the same rate as their low value kilowatt hours. Um, so the, the implication there is that they're not, uh, they're not paying their fair share of those peak costs. So basically producing peak energy is more expensive than producing a flat line rate, especially in a state like Illinois where we have a lot of uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, is there a way to start forcing those peak consumers to actually go on the open market and buy energy to compensate for their peak load, like you know, so they actually have to set up options and things like that. Uh, there are other things you could do to basically force people to change the infrastructure so that there were batteries in places where uh, you know you could set up batteries or you can set up inertial type systems where you know maybe set up something spinning around at the middle of the night and then have it keep going uh, during the day and that, that way you have a flat you know production of energy and stuff like that. Has any of that like infrastructure stuff been talked about and maybe making the peak consumers pay for that infrastructure? Um, well the way the way to make them pay for that infrastructure is if you if you get folks who would save from dynamic pricing onto those onto those prices, then more of the socialized cost is gonna fall onto the, the folks who are still using the flat rate. So that, that would increase the flat rate marginally. You can't really force people what to buy. Um, you, you, Why not? I mean, if, it, if there's a large plant out there that requires more energy, obviously it's, you know, it's making money off of that peak usage. Why not, you know, for them making a profit? <laughs> rather than having a residential customer who's just living. But actually these are the differences in the residential customers itself. Uh, so, but then why not do the wealthy? Hold on, just a second. Then why not just have the wealthy people who have the high capacity AC units yeah, that. pay for the extra load and stuff like that? that. Um, I, th that would be a very difficult thing politically to do. <laughs> because all of this stuff that you, has to go through either the legislature or the ICC. Um, and yeah, it, it mostly comes down to you can't tell people what rate design they're going to be on. Are there states where this has been done? Let me ask a different question. But are there states, I'll not talk about Illinois, but are there other states where this has been done? Um, the, the closest thing I can think of um, would be uh, when it comes to electric vehicles. Um, there, are, uh, there are jurisdictions where you're uh, assessed higher I think I have this right, that you're assessed a higher fixed charge uh, if you're an EV owner um, because you're, you're placing a, a different... It, it comes down on your bill. If you yeah. have an electric vehicle, you are 
considered in a different right. category. Um, that's, that's the closest uh, corollary I can come to it. Um, er, there, there is a utility in Arizona um, that attempted to go to mandatory time of use rates uh, and it didn't go over very well. Can you switch over to the map? Very the quickly. map, yeah. Um, so you mentioned that there are strains from um, cost strains from having to produce the marginal energy, but there's also strains and costs associated with having to put in big tubes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not For lack of a better word. Uh, that is what I said, yeah. And um, uh, I don't know very much about electricity infrastructure, sure. but how much um, area sort of geographically do these tubes, um, I, I know the wires, um, yeah. uh, cover, um, and um, do they s represent a significant enough portion of the cost that we can put in smaller tubes in poor neighborhoods and have to put in bigger tubes in richer neighborhoods and just that all we have? Um, so the, the delivery grid, is where you're is where you're seeing local differences. Um, so uh, you you can't really put in. I mean, the the delivery grid is sized to serve predicted local load. Um, transmission and capacity uh, are happening at a regional level. So Northern Illinois is part of. Um, the, so the regional transmission organization that we're in uh, stretches, we're the sort of the western point of it, and then it goes all the way to Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Ohio. Um, so the cost of maintaining that regional transmission system that, that, that connects all the different load serving entities in, in that area, um, that grid has to be sized to peak load, has to be robust enough to serve that whole uh, region a, a, at its highest use. Um, the, the, these regional transmission organizations were, uh, came about after, I remember there was a big blackout in Ohio um, so many years ago, uh, and that is when they started, um, well, the, the, the grid already existed, but uh, processes were put in place to do more forward planning, um, and that's so the transmission is one product, maintaining the, the cross state lines, uh, and then capacity is another product, which is getting, slowly becoming a bigger and bigger part of, part of the bill, um, which, uh, which is another product that has to be sized to, to peak load. Uh, that's the definition of it is, here's what your utility's peak load is gonna be we need to schedule out so many must run hours for generators uh, and give them, you're essentially paying them to agree to be on when called on at, at peak load. Um, so that's another sort of insurance product that's slowly eating up more and more of customers' bills. And those are regional. Unfortunately, we're now sincerely.